Hi everyone, it's really a great pleasure to have you attending this tutorial. I guess that if you're here, it's because you're interested in knowing how the Wi-Fi of the future will be. And that's exactly what we will learn today. To answer that question about what the Wi-Fi of the future will be like, we'll have to touch and learn about several interrelated topics. And here's an outline of this tutorial. We'll learn a bit about the history of Wi-Fi and how it has evolved to present day 802.11ax or Wi-Fi 6. We'll understand what motivates a further evolution towards 802.11be or Wi-Fi 7. We'll also review in detail the new features in next generation Wi-Fi from a technical standpoint and we'll go through recent performance evaluation results to appreciate the potential improvements brought by such new features. And of course, we'll give a forward-looking view at the open problems and future research. Today, I'll be joined by two leading experts on Wi-Fi, Lorenzo and Boris. Give us a minute to introduce ourselves before kicking off the tutorial. I'm Gio, hi, I'm an ex-world nomad. I've lived in 10 countries across six continents, either for work, love, or simply adventure. But now I call Barcelona home. So who doesn't love Barcelona? I'm lucky to see the Mediterranean Sea out of my window while recording this presentation. Uh, but there's more, our university, UPF, is really a great place to work. So do get in touch if you're interested in working with us. Hi everyone, my name is Lorenzo and I'm currently a senior research engineer at Nokia Bell Labs, Germany. I'm coming from past experience as an R&D system engineer for an Italian small medium enterprise and grown up and studied in Milan, Italy. My current focus is on the evolution of Wi-Fi and in particular on the techniques and solution for enabling reliable low latency operation in the license spectrum. Hi everyone. My name is Boris. I am an associate professor at UPF, where I head the wireless networking group. My main research interests are on wireless networks, adaptive systems, and machine learning. If you are interested in what we do, please visit our webpage. Together with Gio and some other colleagues, we aim to further strain UPF and Barcelona as a worldwide reference for research in next-generation Wi-Fi. I'm sure you will enjoy this tutorial. This tutorial would not have been possible without the help of our former colleagues and friends, Adrian and David. So they took part in the preparation of this presentation. They brought fresh updates from the IEEE standardization meetings and contributed to the specification of 11BE ultimately. Thanks also to Mika and Oli, other Nokia Wi-Fi experts based in Finland. We also need to acknowledge the support of various funding agencies and projects lists listed on this slide. I wish I could have used some of this money to travel to Taiwan and meet you all in person, but hopefully next time. Great, so uh, now that you know us, let's get started with the first part of the tutorial. Here's what we'll learn in the next one hour or so. Uh, we'll start with an introduction to Wi-Fi, showing how it has evolved so far. Lorenzo will explain to you what the objectives of next generation Wi-Fi 11B are and how the 11B task group plans to achieve them. Uh, to meet its demanding requirements, 11B will include many new features. Boris and I will be overviewing those um, that can be considered as key upgrades over the state-of-the-art 11AX. Finally, Lorenzo will show us some very interesting performance evaluation, which compares 11BE and 11AX side by side, showing the gains provided by such key upgrades. So Lorenzo, please tell us a bit about the history of Wi-Fi. Thanks, Giovanni. So yeah, let's start then from giving you a general overview of the importance of Wi-Fi and uh, its evolution. So I believe by now, uh, after almost a year of working from home, 
restriction and uh, confinement that it should be clear to everyone of the importance of Wi-Fi and how it is currently vehiculating almost all the communication that we have with the external world. So, for example, with our working colleagues and as well how it is bringing to us our daily dose of entertainment like video calls with families and friends, streaming movies, gaming, social network, etc. So with this in mind, what are the clear advantages of next generation Wi-Fi products with respect to other cellular technologies? So first of all, the use of the spectrum is free. Companies and individuals are nowadays very keen in avoiding unnecessary expenditures and buying license for the spectrum is not always the preferable option. Secondly, Wi-Fi devices are widely diffused with 13 billion of installed devices and a growth of 4 billion only last year. According to available studies, Wi-Fi is expected to generate a global value of $3.5 trillion by 2023. Finally, Wi-Fi is the king technology indoor for residential, public spaces, enterprises and industrial use cases. But the advantages goes always well with challenges and uh, they, these are mainly driven by the fact that the new digital applications are adding more and more stringent requirements in terms of capacity, delay and reliability. So if increasing the capacity in Wi-Fi can be considered a traditional problem, targeting low latency and high reliability operation in the, is, the new, is the new paradigm. So we believe that supporting low latency and reliability in the license spectrum, of course up to a certain extent, will be one of the main research and technological challenges for the near future. And this will be fired up by the strong competition currently brought in by 5G inside indoor enterprise and, and factory market. In this slide, we wanted to summarize potential use cases for the future digital home. So we've foreseen that monitoring, whether this will be for security or health purposes, will require Wi-Fi to significantly deliver higher capacity and interference prevention mechanism. Automation will also be part of the picture to manage appliances, heating and conditioning system, home robots, etc. This will mainly have the target to anticipate our needs. And finally, Augmented and virtual reality application will add to the capacity requirement also new needs in terms of achieving new challenging latency deadline in the end-to-end -end operation. Looking instead into the future enterprise, guaranteeing five or more nines of reliability with less than one millisecond latency end-to-end -end will be a goal for wireless technology. But not only that, guaranteeing a customized access to each individual a seamless interplay with already deployed industrial solution and no compromises in terms of safety and security will be important aspect too. For sure Wi-Fi will have bad time to compete with licensed technology like 5G for example, but it has no alternative rather than fighting for maintaining its predominant in the enterprise and industrial market. The evolution of the next generation Wi-Fi is progressively leaning towards new low latency techniques and solution, trying to tackle all the industrial deployment that do not necessarily require the reliability and latency level offered by 5G. And we believe there are not so few. Let's have a look now on how Wi-Fi protocol have evolved in time. So we started the Wi-Fi trip in 1997 with the definition of the original standard, the 802.11. Their carrier sensing multiple assets with collision avoidance was defined for the first time. In 1999, 802.11b is basically an amendment of the initial specification that extends throughput up to 11 megabit per second using the same 2.4 gigahertz band. Also in 1999, 802.11a was defined for operating in the 5 gigahertz band. In 2001, then the FCC allowed the use of OFDM in the 2.4 GHz, which led to the 802.11G amendment. Spatial multiplexing is the key throughput enhancing technology in 802.11N. Although the channels also add a larger bandwidth, 40 MHz, formed by using two continuous 20 MHz channels. Moreover, 
it introduced up to four spatial streams that can be multiplex, but towards a single user only, as there is no multi-user memory yet. 802.11 AC has introduced larger bandwidth, 80 and 160 MHz, and channels could be non-contiguous. In addition, it supports downlink multi-user memory with up to four users. Finally, 802.11 AX provides an increased average throughput per user in high-density scenarios such as train stations, airports, and stadiums. The standard is basically now mainly finalized, and among the main new features, we can highlight the enabling of both uplink and downlink multi-user memory with up to 8 users. So where are we now? The current standard under development is the 802.11 BE, and it will be the focus of this seminar. So, what about the main objective and timeline of the ongoing Wi-Fi standardization? The main objective for 802.11b is to improve the maximum throughput, targeting 30 gigabit per second per access point, which corresponds to four times what can be achieved with the current standard. To achieve this goal, new MAC and FI mode of operation are under discussion and also additional frequency are addressed. In particular, I'm referring to the 1.2 GHz of spectrum that is available now in the 6 GHz band, and that this spectrum has been recently allocated by the Federal Communication Commission in the US. Understanding the growing importance of supporting low latency operation, 11B has as well among its objectives to support at least one mode of operation that can improve the worst case latency and jitter but they didn't specify any specific value. Last but not least, backward compatibility and coexistence with previous 802.11 standards, it is also listed among the goals. At the beginning of the standardization process, two development cycles were considered, a serialized approach and a cascade approach. Serialized approach has typically a five-year horizon and includes all the possible features that are to be included in the new standard. Typically, this was always the approach in the previous 802.11 standardization cycles. On the contrary, the cascade approach targets to have several releases containing, containing each subject of features and partially overlapping in time such that by time one release is completed, the next one has already started. This is typically the approach followed in the 3GPP standardization activity, for example. And at the end, it was decided in May 2019 to adopt the serialized approach for the 11B standardization. And the intended timeline is indicated here uh, on the bottom. So in May 2018, correspond to the initial formation of the extremely high throughput topic interest group, followed in July by the consecutive study group. This initial activity is contributed to the creation of the project authorization request that happened in March 2019, followed in May 2019 by the formation of the 802.11b task group. The selection of the features that will be included in the standards had been decided in September 2020, so very recently. And the group, the group is currently focusing on the writing of the first draft at the moment. However, the certification of the first 802.11b product is expected only in the first half of the 2024. However, even if the serialized approach was selected, several companies have raised their attention to the need of prioritizing a subset of features by adopting a two-release framework. This motion was mainly motivated by the need of respecting the deadline associated to the first draft of the standard, and meeting market expectations, product launch dates, and fight the competition of other technology. The proposal was, was well perceived by the task group and in January 2020 it was decided how to split the features between release 1 and release 2, with release 1 features meant to contribute to the first and second draft of the standard, while instead release 2 ones to the third and fourth draft. 
Here you can see a graph that summarizes the DCL approach with the relays based process. And finally, here in this slide, you can see the agreed 11B target features, which we decided to divide for your clarity in two categories. Direct upgrades from the 802.11ax, which is the current standard adopted by the most recent Wi Fi product. And in this category, we are listing the improvements regarding the bandwidth, resource unit allocations, partial multiplexing, and modulation and coding schemes. And then a second category the, where we listed the, all the ma major disruptive improvements associated to, for example, retransmission, multi link operation, and multi AP coordination. So I leave now to Boris and Giovanni the task to guide you through the first category of features. This is Boris. I am back to talk about a first group of the new 11B features that can be seen as upgrades or improvements of the 11AX ones. Let's look at the main ones in detail. The first feature I am going to describe is the allocation of up to 320 MHz bandwidth per access point, along with a more efficient utilization of non-contiguous spectrum. For over 20 years, Wi-Fi has been working by broadcasting air waves over two bands, 2.4 and 5 GHz. In April 2020, the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, cleared the way for a third band, the 6 GHz band. While this decision may have given the United States an initial lead on the 6 GHz market, other regions, including Europe and Asia Pacific, are also exploring access to this band. In the meantime, Wi-Fi 6 is ready to use the 6 GHz spectrum as it becomes available worldwide, and devices equipped with the chips and radios needed to operate in this new band will get the 6E seal, the E standing for extension. The Wi-Fi Alliance plans to launch its Wi-Fi 6G certification in early 2021, with more than 300 million compliant devices expected to come to market the same year. Besides consumer access points and smartphones, a strong adoption of Wi-Fi 6G is also anticipated by industrial environments. As you can guess, moving to the 6 GHz band changes completely the game at least from what we were used when almost all Wi-Fi devices were operating only at the 2.4 GHz band. It opens a new world of possibilities, such as effectively using extremely wide channels, which is known as channel bonding. The use of channel bonding, this is increasing the channel width, is a simple strategy to achieve higher transmission rates, and so higher throughput and lower delay. Before talking about channel bonding in 11B, let me talk about white channel and channel bonding in 11AX, which uses basically the same mechanism introduced by 11AC. In 11AX, the access point and the stations can adaptively select the bandwidth for each transmitted frame. For that, there is defined a set of embedded channels with primary and secondary ones. Having accessed the medium in the primary 20 MHz subchannel, a station can expand the bandwidth by an iterative concatenation of the secondary channels if they are idle. In other words, if the secondary 20 MHz channel is idle, a station can transmit in a 40 MHz channel. If both the secondary 20 MHz and the secondary 40 MHz channels are idle, an 80 MHz channel can be used, and so on. This is nice. However, in real dense deployments, with many BSS operating in the same area, 80 and 160 MHz channels may not be easy to find. This situation has raised many reasonable doubts about how much effective is channel bonding in practice, and if we have to waste time thinking on it. Regarding those doubts on the effectiveness of channel bonding I mentioned before, let me present you some recent results showing the 5 GHz band occupancy. We did the measurements in 11 different locations in 2019, so the last year. Except in the Camp Nou Stadium in Barcelona, where we did the measurement during a match with almost 100,000 people there, 
In all the other places, both in Houston and in Barcelona, the scenarios that can be classified as dense in most of the cases, the average spectrum occupancy, as you can see in the slide, is below 3%. This is, however, in average, as we also measure at few and short periods with high occupancy, around 40%. You can find all these details in the reference at the bottom of the slide. So, the takeaway is clear. Nowadays, channel bonding can be effectively used to improve throughput, as there is plenty of idle spectrum waiting to be used. Indeed, you can already guess that the 6 GHz band will be an even much better place to implement channel bonding, as initially, the number of other networks there will be extremely low. Before, I mentioned that we found some periods with high spectrum occupancy. In those periods, channel bonding will certainly suffer, in part because of the spectrum fragmentation that may result from legacy Wi-Fi networks using only 20 MHz channels. For instance, consider an 11AX network, able to transmit over an 80 MHz channel. However, the secondary 20 MHz channel is almost always busy, which prevents the 11AX network to use the 40 MHz secondary channel, even if it is idle all the time. To avoid such underutilization of channel resources, caused by the rigid channel bonding rules, 11AX introduces preamble puncturing, allowing an access point to transmit in punctured 80 or 160 MHz channels when part of the secondary channels are busy, which are basically skipped. Preamble puncturing is designed to enhance the channel utilization for dense access point deployments, a scenarios where 80 or 160 MHz may not be fully available all the time. Note that to implement preamble puncturing, 11AX relies on the use of OFDMA, since non-contiguous channels can only be allocated to different stations. We will come back to this aspect in a while. Following with the previous example, let me show you this picture. Let us assume that our 11AX access point is transmitting data to station A and to station B, and that there is plenty of data available for both stations, so the access point can transmit continuously. As you can see, most of the transmissions using the full channel bonding only allows the access point to use a 20 MHz channel. Instead, using preamble puncturing, the secondary 40 MHz channel can be always used. So, the performance gains are, I guess, clear. Wi-Fi 7 devices will be able to operate in the 6 GHz band from the beginning. With this new spectrum, as you can imagine, there is a lot of discussion about increasing the maximum transmission bandwidth from 160 to 320 MHz. There are also discussions about defining new channel access rules in the 6 GHz band, for instance, removing IDCA and allowing access points to control all transmissions in both uplink and downlink, so to achieve a more efficient use of the resources. This cannot currently be done in the lower bands because there are many coexisting devices and technologies, but perhaps it will be feasible in the clean 6 GHz band. Coexistence with current technologies operating in this band needs to be managed. This includes fixed and satellite systems, as well as potentially 5G new radio and licenses. Moreover, in the 6 GHz band, Wi-Fi may not be treated as an incumbent as it was in the 5 GHz band. If that's the case, 11B devices will have to include mechanisms to avoid interfering those native 6 GHz technologies, such as traditionally done in cognitive radio solutions. Perfect. We are now going to focus on another very interesting feature of 11B, the possibility to allocate multiple resource units to the same station. First, let me just refresh how OFDMA works in 11AX. The idea behind OFDMA is as simple as that multiple devices can be simultaneously scheduled in groups of different subcarriers. Those groups of subcarriers are called resource units. 
Dividing the channel bandwidth in multiple resource units and assigning them to different users may increase the duration of the transmission itself, but it also reduces the channel access and waiting delay, thus likely improving the overall latency. Also, the use of OFDMA adds some extra flexibility to distribute resources between devices with different traffic profiles. For instance, we can assign a large resource unit to a video camera with many packets in its buffer and a small one to a an IoT device that has a single small packet to transmit. As you can see in the example of the slide, we have two stations, station 1 and station 2, with data ready for transmission. In the first case, we can see how the two stations transmit sequentially, this is without OFDMA, while in the second case there is a single but larger OFDMA transmission that includes the data from the two stations. Although it's just an illustration, the total time required to transmit the two packets is shorter when OFDMA is used, which is the main takeaway, takeaway of this slide. Here, in the right side of the slide, you have the resource units that correspond to an 80 MHz channel. The smallest division of the channel, 26 tones, accommodates up to 9 users in a 20 MHz channel. The resource unit of 242 484 and 996 tones correspond to the 20, 40 and 80 MHz channels, respectively. As I said before, different resource unit sizes are very useful to accommodate different traffic needs. An innovative aspect of 11AX is that the access point can take the scheduler role and decide when to initiate a transmission, in both uplink and downlink allocating also the corresponding resource unit to the selected stations. To do that, however, the access point requires information from the stations, such as the channel state across all the bands and the buffer state of each station. To obtain all this information, of course, there are some overheads that may also penalize the performance of OFDMA. Let us now focus on the example of the slide. Note that we are assuming that the access point has all required information with respect to the channel and buffer state. First, the access point reserves the channel using the multi-user RTS and CTS mechanism. Then, it transmits a trigger frame to allocate the resource units to station 1, 2 and 3. After that, the three stations start their transmissions. Note that the station 1 gets the larger resource unit, a full 20 MHz channel, as it is the one with more packets in its buffer. Finally, the access point replies with a multi-station block ACK to acknowledge the transmission from all three stations. Before moving to the next slide, I'm sure you have already realized that we are not using all the 80 MHz channels as we are only able to allocate one resource unit to each station. This situation limits, of course, the efficiency of OFDMA. As we have seen in the previous example, a key limitation of OFDMA in 11AX is that we may end up not being able to use all the channels. This is because 11AX can only assign a single resource unit to each station. Such a restriction may lead to channel waste and throughput degradation in a scenarios with a small number of stations. Also, having only one resource unit per station may hurt the diversity gain. What do I mean? Well, if multiple resource units can be allocated to the same station, that station, for instance, can use them to send the same data over them, over the multiple resource units, thus improving the chances to receive the data correctly. In the following example, let us assume that the access point has only data for one station. Then, the access point can assign only the primary 20 MHz channel to that station, not the additional 40 MHz, even if the preamble puncturing can be used. Why? Well, as we have seen before, it is just because only one resource unit per station can be assigned. Therefore, transmission towards the same user is not possible in the two reach most channels, which means that the access point uses three times less bandwidth than it could, 20 instead of 60 MHz. 
To solve that situation and avoid wasting bandwidth, 11B will support the assignment of multiple resource units per station. Let us see how this brings gains into different examples. First example. As before, assume there is only one station to be served, and the secondary 20 MHz channel is busy. In this case, preamble puncturing will allow us to assign 60 MHz to such a station. Recall, as we just saw, that in this case, with 11 AX, the station will only get the primary 20 MHz channel. So, 60 instead of 20 MHz is a big improvement. Second example, now assume there are two stations to be served, that the 80 MHz channel is available, that the station 2 only needs 20 MHz, and that the station 1 would like to use as much bandwidth as possible. With 11 AX, if a station 2 is allocated a 242-tone resource unit, a 20 MHz channel, then a station 1 can only use 484 tones resource unit, so 40 MHz channel. And then 20 MHz are wasted, which is about 25% of the total bandwidth. With 11B, the access point can allocate two resource units to station 1, one of 40 MHz and one of 20 MHz, thus making full use of the bandwidth. To conclude, I hope that these two examples have been illustrative enough to appreciate the benefits of this nice 11B capability. Now, I pass the token to Jim, who will introduce another very interesting feature of 11B, the use of up to 16 special streams. It's Gio again here. Uh, Boris has just showed us how 11B plans to achieve significant throughput improvements and not only that, by using more bandwidth and in a more efficient manner. Uh, the newly opened 6 GHz band sounds very appealing indeed. Uh, however, besides frequency and time, one can also leverage the spatial dimension to achieve substantial peak throughput enhancements. Uh, this is the reason why many companies involved in the standardization of 11B are considering increasing the maximum number of spatial streams from 8 to 16. Uh, this change would be particularly useful for indoor operations with a rich scattering environment with high angular spreads uh, because that allows to more easily separate information streams in space. To better understand this, let's introduce the concepts of MIMO and spatial multiplexing. More antennas and better spatial multiplexing capabilities have been consistently added to Wi-Fi access points over the years. If you recall, Lorenzo showed this when overviewing the history of Wi-Fi's evolution. Uh, such capabilities have helped supporting the increasing number of devices with wireless connectivity. Uh, so, what can an access point do when availing of multiple antennas? If the station also has multiple antennas, then the access point can transmit multiple streams of information simultaneously through what's called single user MIMO. MIMO stands for multiple input, multiple output. The maximum number of streams is capped by the minimum between the number of antennas at the access point and the number of antennas at the station. For example, if the access point has four antennas and the station has two, then the, the maximum number of streams will be two. Alternatively, the access point can send one single stream to the station, but focusing its transmission towards the station thanks to its multiple antennas, doing what's called beam forming. However, regulations in the unlicensed band do not allow to focus energy towards a particular direction. Therefore, when using beamforming, an access point must correspondingly reduce its transmit power rather than operating at maximum power. Notice that beamforming can be helpful in reception too. So what we saw in the previous slide refers to using multiple antennas for communication between an access point and a single station. A yet more powerful technique is called spatial multiplexing, 
where an access point can simultaneously transmit to multiple users at the same time or frequency. This was introduced in 11AC, where access points were allowed to transmit up to eight streams to up to four devices in downlink. However, this had some limitations. Indeed, many stations only had a single antenna, meaning that only one stream could be transmitted to such stations. Second, in order to perform spatial multiplexing, an access point needs to estimate accurately the channel between itself and the station. This is done through channel sounding, where the access point transmits a pilot signal and the stations respond with a channel estimate. And being such responses serially transmitted, the whole process is slowed down. Finally, having spatial multiplexing in downlink only means that the uplink becomes the bottleneck, for example, for the transmission of acknowledgements. So to address the previous issues, 11AX introduced spatial multiplexing in uplink 2, enabling access points to spatially multiplex up to 8 single stream devices in both downlink and uplink. So how does it work? In uplink, uh, the access point initiates simultaneous transmission from each of the stations through a trigger frame. When the multiple users respond simultaneously with their own packets, the access point applies a matrix filter to the received beams and separates the information contained in each uplink beam. Each multi-user MIMO transmission may have its own modulation encoding set and a different number of spatial streams. So to coordinate uplink multi-user MIMO or uplink OFDMA transmissions, the access point sends a trigger frame to all users this frame indicates the number of spatial streams and the OFDMA allocations, frequency and resource unit sizes of each user. It also contains power control information, such that individual users can increase or reduce the transmitted power according to their distance from the access point. The access point also tells all users when to start and stop transmitting. So once the access point receives the frames from all users, it sends them back a block acknowledgement to finish the operation. Many Wi-Fi stakeholders foresee the need to further upgrade the access point spatial multiplexing capabilities to accommodate up to 16 spatial streams. This upgrade has the potential of doubling 11B spectral efficiency with respect to 11AX. Once again, one of the bottlenecks as we increase the number of antennas is CSI acquisition. The spatial multiplexing gains could be limited by the overhead of the channel sounding process. This process is crucial to acquire accurate channel state information or CSI. Doubling the number of spatial streams while reusing the same explicit CSI acquisition procedure currently specified in 11AX may not be scalable. So how does CSI acquisition currently work in 11AX? 11AX employs an explicit feedback procedure similar to that of 11AC. So the beamformer sends a null data packet announcement frame followed by a null data packet. An NDP is a physical protocol data unit without any data field. Then the beamforme measures the channel and responds with a beamforming feedback frame containing a compressed feedback matrix. The beamformer uses this information to compute the channel matrix. Then the beamformer can use this channel matrix to focus the RF energy towards each user. Two alternatives are possible to this. One is to reduce the sounding overhead, uh, meaning the beamforming feedback frame, and the other is to do an, ex an implicit CSI acquisition. So 11B is considering the introduction of an implicit channel sounding procedure that relies on pilots transmitted by the stations and exploits uplink downlink channel reciprocity. Such implicit sounding would likely require access points to implement a calibration method to prevent hardware mismatches that could break the channel reciprocity. 
Right, so besides increasing the bandwidth up to 320 megahertz and beyond and increasing the number of spatial streams as we have seen, it is quite natural to increase nominal data rates by increasing the order of modulation up to 4K QAM. For higher SNR scenarios, for example with short-range communications, higher modulation encoding schemes can provide higher data rates. However, each additional increase in the order of constellation gives a smaller and smaller gain. Introducing 256 QAM in 11AC provided a 33% gain with respect to the 64 QAM of 11N. 1024 QAM of 11AX increased nominal data rates by only 25%. So 4096 QAM will give only a 20% gain. That's because it goes logarithmically. At the same time, the cost of such a small gain is high. The SNR needed at the receiver side to accept the 4096 QAM is about 40 dB, which is quite high for a typical Wi-Fi scenario. Such a high SNR can be achieved with beamforming though, so 4K QAM modulation can be feasible when the access point has many antennas and serves only one station with few antennas. In such a case, multi-user transmissions cannot be used and the number of spatial streams is low. Thus, the only way to increase throughput is by using a higher order of constellation. Okay, so this is Lorenzo again. And um, now that Boris and Giovanni have clarified to you the main expected upgrades of 11BE over the current uh, 11AX standard, I'm here now back to present a realistic performance evaluation that uh, we have conducted using our Nokia standard compliance simulation tool. And hopefully this will further clarify the benefits and the improvements that uh, will be brought in few years time by the new standard. So the results have been reported in the IEEE communication magazine papers that uh, is here indicated at the bottom. In particular, for this study, we compare 11AX and 11BE standard by considering the following parameters. In terms of transmission bandwidth, we configure 80 MHz, uh, which is the mandatory bandwidth for 11AX. And then for the 11BE, we consider the 160 MHz, which is likely to become the mandatory bandwidth. 320 MHz instead is likely to become optional. In terms of deployment band, we use the 5 GHz for the 11AX and the 6 GHz for the 11B, which has been recently released by FCC. Number of spatial streams has been configured to 8 for the 11AX and instead for the 11B has been increased to 16 as it was presented before to you. The CSI acquisition protocol uh, is the explicit one for the 11AX. Instead, for the 11B is under discussion the implicit one, which is required since the number of spatial streams has been increased and uh, this may pose problem to, to, to the overhead. What is the scenario that we use for our performance evaluation study? We took as a reference a single floor enterprise with an area of 40 by 40 meters. We also consider four channels of 160 megahertz deployed in the 6 gigahertz band for the 11BE and 8 megahertz in the 5 gigahertz band for the 11AX. The channel model is the spatial correlated 38901 indoor hotspot with mixed line of sight probability. In this model, the losses introduced by the wall are considered statistically. About the station deployment, we consider 512 uniformly distributed station with a single antenna and uh, deployed at a height of 1 meter. Regarding the access point configuration, we consider 16 ceiling mounted access points that are deployed on a regular grid at the height of 3 meters and equally separated by 10 meters. Each access point has the possibility to multiplex up to 16 and 8 spatial stream depending if we are adopting the 11BE or the 11AX protocol. Regarding the channel allocation, we assign one channel per access point following an optimal assignment such that 
to obtain the maximum reuse distance. You can see here in the figure on the right hand side, indicated by the different colors, the channel allocation pattern considered in our study. Moreover, the association of the stations to the access point was based on the strongest average received signal strength. An important aspect that we consider in our performance analysis is related to the, to the power regulation in place in the license spectrum. This re power regulation is basically enforced by the European Union, which is generally the most restrictive region. These constraints are related to the maximum effective isotropic radiated power, also called EIRP, and the maximum EIRP is computed as the sum of the conducted power plus the maximum antenna element gain plus the maximum array gain. The conducted power in our simulation is uh, assumed to be 24 dBm. The maximum antenna element gain is zero because we are using omnidirectional element. While the maximum ray gain can be computed as the 10 log 10 of the ratio between the number of antenna of the array divide and divided by the number of stations that are multiplexed together. So which are the implications of this? The main implication of this is that multi-antenna AP may be affected by this limitation when transmitting downlink, since their array gains may force the access point to significantly reduce their transmitted power to meet this ERP constraint. In applic instead, the station have lower conducted power and a reduced number of antenna. In our case, we are considering only one antenna at the station. So the APs are free to fully exploit the available beamforming gain without any restriction. Now, before diving into the performance results, let me give you a quick overview of the detailed simulation parameters adopted to run our complex system level simulation. And please keep in mind that the results you are going to see in the following slides were obtained using our standard compliant tool, which accounts for accurate channel and traffic models, regulatory constraints, as we shown to you in a previous slide, as well as five and mark detail procedure. So what do we have among the five and mark parameters that we want to alight? The first thing is the antenna array size of the access point, which correspond to a 4x2 for the 11AX standard and a 4x4 for the 11B standard. The noise figure so, is set to 7 and 9dB respectively for the access point and the station. The precoding decoding algorithm that is applied is a zero forcing. And the, scheduling, the station scheduling strategies, which is based on a round robin with the semi-orthogonal user selection, is basically as a method that is particularly keen to allocate and prevent user with spatially correlated wireless channel to, multiple, to be multiplexed in the same transmission opportunity. And finally, the duration of the transmission opportunity itself, which correspond to 4 milliseconds. Regarding the deployment and the channel model parameters, I gave you already many details in the, the main details in the previous slide, so I think there is no need here to enter too much into, into this. While for the traffic model, it is important to highlight that we adopt an FTP model 3 with packet size of 0 0.5 megabytes and with a traffic generated per station equal to 75 megabit per second. So we are targeting here a very uh, high traffic load. Finally, we consider after the deployment, deployed station to perform downlink and the other half to perform uplink transmission. So please remember that we deployed 512 stations, so here we are targeting a very dense deployment. So I hope it till here everything is clear to you in terms of scenarios, access point configuration, channel traffic models and all the other simulation parameters that I presented in the previous slide to you. So saying this, let me show you here our figures of the performance results we have obtained and the associated main takeaways. So what we represent in the figures on the left hand side is the cumulative density function of the access point throughput both in downlink and uplink for the two versions of the standard under consideration. In total, we have four curves. They correspond to the downlink performance achieved with the 11AX set of features we simulated, which is the blue continuous line, and the respective uplink, which is the blue dashed line. 
and as well they correspond to the respective downlink performance achieved with the set of features for the 11BE, the red dashed dotted line, and the respective uplink, the red dotted line. What are the main considerations? So first of all, it is very evident how the 11B configuration is providing a remarkable throughput gain. In particular, we can see that we register around three times gain in the median of the CDF for both the downlink and uplink direction. While instead, if we look at the fifth percentile, we register a 4.6 times gain in downlink and a 2.2 times gain in uplink. A second observation we can make is that the 11BE does not reach the maximum theoretical four times gain with respect to the 11AX. There are three main reasons that can be associated to these results. The first one is that 11BE cell edge stations do not benefit from the larger bandwidth. And why is this? Because the power constraint, in fact, reduces the power allocation per carrier and larger bandwidths correspond to larger noise power. The second reason is that 11BE access point do not always have 16 stations to multiplex. So although the traffic load that we configure is very high, as well as the deployment density of the station, in not, in not all the cases that there is the need for the access point to multiplex 16 stations in the same transmission opportunity. This assumption has been adopted to compute the theoretical maximum gain. And finally, the third reason that we want to mention is that the signal to interference plus noise ratio degrades when many stations are multiplexed together. This has to do with the equal power allocation split among all the multiplexed users and the reduced beforming gain because all the degree of freedom of the antenna rays are now dedicated to address the different channel subspaces of the multiplexed station instead of uh, contributing to the beamforming gain. Another additional comment can be made also referring to the same performance results figure that we showed in the previous slide. And is that the station generally experience smaller throughput in downlink with respect to the uplink. And why is that? So again here main three reasons to mention. The first one is that the station have a larger noise figures than access point and this leads to reduced downlink SNRs. The second reason is associated to the power split that the access points need to perform when more than one station is multiplexed in the same transmission opportunity. And finally, the third reason is that the uplink to downlink interference between the station is generally larger than the one experiencing between the access point. And this is an effect of the very high dense deployment that we simulated and the fact that stations adopt only a single unidirectional antenna. So basically they have no mean to spatially suppress interference. Right, so this concludes the first part of the tutorial. Stay with us because in the second part we will keep discussing new features in 11BE. Um, shifting the focus onto more disruptive new features, not just upgrades from 11AX. We will also see new performance evaluation results and we will discuss open problems and research directions for the feature. So I'll see you in the second part of the tutorial. Hi, this is Gio again. Welcome back to the second part of the tutorial. I hope you enjoyed the first part and had a good coffee break and now get ready as there's much more interesting stuff to come. So here's what awaits for the next hour or so. If you think the features we presented so far are innovative, well the ones we will discuss now are even more disruptive. They aren't just evolutions of 11AX features but rather some paradigm shift. We'll examine them in detail. You'll see that one of these key features to be introduced in 11BE is coordinated beamforming. Lorenzo will show us some fresh standard compliance simulation results to appreciate how coordinated beamforming can really curb the transmission delay, thus enabling a whole new set of use cases for Wi-Fi. Boris will then share with us his vision on what's there to do in terms of research on Wi-Fi, looking further ahead and even beyond 11BE.
Now I'm going to start discussing important 11B features. Some of these might take just a little longer to be defined in the standard as there is disruptive and not incremental improvements over 11AEX. The next feature I'll describe is hybrid ARQ or HARQ. Current Wi-Fi systems rely on the retransmission of MAC protocol data units MPDUs, when these are not successfully decoded or simply when a NAC is not received. In this ARQ approach, the receiver discards the failed MPDUs before receiving its retransmitted version, not allowing soft combining. But with the requirement of enhanced reliability and reduced latency, multiple companies advocate that 11BE should evolve towards hybrid ARQ capabilities or HARQ. With HARQ, devices attempting to decode a retransmitter MPDU do not ignore their previous unsuccessful MPDUs, but instead combine their soft bits. This way they increase the SNR and the probability of decoding the packet correctly. The HIAQ mechanism is already implemented in cellular systems and it can provide SINR gains of approximately 4 dBs with respect to ARQ in an ideal AWGN channel. However, the throughput gains could be different when considering realistic Wi-Fi scenarios with bursty interference due to collisions. Importantly, HIRQ is also more robust to the errors in the estimation of the SNR at the receiver. It allows the transmitter to select a higher modulation encoding scheme opportunistically. So either the transmission is fast with a good channel and a high MCS, or the receiver extracts some information anyway with a poor channel and decodes the packet with a retransmission, avoiding reducing the MCS for such retries. The soft combining operation of HARQ requires extra computational capabilities and memory requirements for storing past transmissions. So further studies are expected to evaluate performance and complexity requirements. One of the approved revolutionary changes in 11BE or Wi-Fi 7 if you will is native support of multi-link operations which is favorable for both high data rates and low latency. With the emergence of dual radio stations and tri-band access points capable of simultaneously operating at 2.4, 5 and 6 GHz, one of the main objectives of 11B is to make more efficient use of these multiple bands and channels. In particular, Although modern chipsets can currently use several links simultaneously, these links are independent, which limits the efficiency of such operation. 11B strives to find such a level of synchronization between the links that allows efficient use of the channel resources. So with three bands available, it makes sense to design systems that can exploit them simultaneously. Now I'll describe four of the most appealing approaches being considered for 11B. So one could do load balancing according to traffic needs. For example, this means assigning stations to different bands depending on the radio distance. Dual band access points can transmit simultaneously using both 2.4 and 5 GHz bands but to different stations. Since stations are generally single radio and can only operate at one frequency at a given time. One way forward is to let stations have simultaneous transmission and reception capabilities on different frequency bands, which is currently not possible, and aggregate data. Data transmission and reception separated in different bands can help to further reduce latency. Not only data traffic can be sent and received simultaneously, but also acknowledgements can be sent in a different band. Separating control and data plane could also be useful. In fact, many transmissions require information such as uh, buffer status to guarantee an efficient resource allocation. And currently, ac acquiring this information introduces overhead. And there's a delay between the acquisition of the information and the response to that operation, for example, due to listen before talk. Another example is to transmit the NAV status in a high band through a lower band 
and react accordingly. This slide shows an example of multilink operations across two bands, 5 GHz and 6 GHz. There are several ways to exploit the availability of two different bands, and in this slide we see, for example, opportunistic link selection, link aggregation, and full duplex. We see packets arriving in downlink or in uplink with their numbering, and we see channels marked as BC in grey, used in downlink in yellow, or used in uplink in blue. So for the first packet to be transmitted in downlink, the 6 GHz channel is opportunistically selected as the 5 GHz channel is busy at that time. Then for the second packet, both links are available and both are used simultaneously through link aggregation. The downlink transmission of this packet is therefore quite fast. Then the 5 GHz band is used opportunistically for the first uplink packet in blue since the 6 GHz band is busy when that packet arrives in the queue. The same thing occurs for the third downlink packet, which is transmitted on the 5 GHz link. Then when the second uplink packet arrives in the queue, in blue, full duplex transmission is exploited and this packet is transmitted in uplink on the 6 GHz band, while the previous downlink packet, in yellow, is still being received on the 5 GHz band, and so on and so forth. Here are the main areas of work and research to enable multilink operations in 11B. Uh, we have multilink association, multilink management to dynamically enable and disable links, power saving in a multilink context, block agreement management, and also devices with simultaneous transmit and receive constraints. Uh, the figure shows an example of a protocol stack for a multi-link device with different Mac and Phi operations on two different bands. Here we see two Macs and two Phi's, as well as two sets of primary and secondary channels on the 5 GHz band. This is because since the 5 GHz band is wide, Many access points have two different sets of radios for lower and upper 5 GHz band. Now Lorenzo will give more details on one of Nokia's concrete proposals for multilink operations in 11BE. Thanks Giovanni. So I'll jump here for a moment to give you a quick overview of what could be a clever optional mode of operation within the multilink framework that uh, was just presented by, by Giovanni. So the first aspect that we considered when building our proposal was that potential issues may arise from multilink operation. The first one is that cost and power consumption associated to the joint operation over multiple links can become very high. And the second is that constraints may also apply when operating links in addition channel. So as an example, you could think, for example, the TX to RX interference that can be generated. So with this in mind, we propose to use only a single phi, however maintaining the possibility to contend for channel access over all the links. The figure on the right uh, highlights the difference between the multilink framework currently under discussion in the 802.11b standardization, which is the figure on the top, and our proposal solution, which is instead the figure on the bottom. Our key target when we were building this solution was mainly to keep the possibility to contend for channel access over all the links, while occupying for transmission only one link at a time. As a consequence, this produces higher chances to find a free channel and the channel access delay can be significantly reduced. So for this reason, we named this mode of operation as reliable low latency multilink. I guess it is quite intuitive at the moment to think that the higher the number of links where a device is able to contend for channel access, the smaller is the channel access delay. As an example, if a, de a device implementing our proposed mode of operation can operate in 8 links and each link is available with 90% probability, in theory such type of device will have a link with 8 nines of availability. 
In the reference indicated uh, here in this slide, you can find the standard contribution we recently presented, which contain all the details of this uh, mode of operation. I'll try here now to give you an example of how this mode of operation works. In particular, let's look at the illustrative example in this slide where we adopt the perspective of a multi-link device with a single file. In this example, we also consider that our multi-link device generate latency-sensitive uplink traffic with short packets and sporadic arrival times. This is the case, for example, of some application targeted by 802.11b, such as uh, augmented reality. We also consider that our multi-link device operate in four adhesion channels uh, through a single physical layer. In this setup, you can observe how the multi-link station simultaneously initiate contention in channel 1, 3 and 4 for immediately transmitting a packet that has arrived at the queue. Let's assume our multi-link device gain channel access in channel 1 and initiate an uplink transmission that terminate with the corresponding block acknowledgement. While performing this uplink transmission in channel 1, you can also observe that other inter-BSS transmission were initiated in channel 3 and 4. But since our multi-link station has only one single file, it is basically blind to what happens in the other links. For this reason, after the reception of the relevant block acknowledgement in channel 1, our multi-link device will apply a probe delay to prevent any potential unfairness issue in channel 2, 3 and 4. Instead, channel asset contention may, may be immediately performed in channel 1. So let's stop here for a few seconds. While one could think that enforcing probe delay is inefficient, we should remember that we consider a device where packets may arrive, for instance, every 10 milliseconds, and where the main objective is to deliver the packets as soon as they arrive to the queue. In our example, you can observe that such probe delay does not effectively introduce additional latency since the second packet has not arrived at the queue yet. So going back to our example and following the timeline, you can observe how, how our device start containing for channel assets in channel two, since the other channels are busy. Upon arrival of a new packet to the queue, the multi-link device will have to perform a short LBT in channel 2 before immediately initiating the transmission of such packet, which at the end was exactly our main objective. This is what is again. Geo has introduced the multi-link operation, which we are sure will be one of the key distinctive features of Wi-Fi 7. Let us now focus on another disruptive feature introduced by 11B, multi-access point coordination, and how it can be applied to implement cooperative special reuse and cooperative OFDMA. To start, something obvious, multi-access point coordination is exactly what its name says, multiple nearby access points that decide to coordinate how they transmit. First, contention is reduced, avoiding, for instance, inter-BSS collisions. And second, the spectrum resources can be better used. How this multi-access point coordination can be implemented? Well, there are two options, using the wired network, which may enable the use of a central controller with a global vision of all the resources. However, this option is outside of the 11B specification and over the air, which can be achieved by exchanging control and management packets between the access points. This is the approach considered by 11B. So, what could be the benefits of coordinating access points? In practical terms, if we remove contention between BSS and use better the spectrum resources, we will for sure improve throughput and reduce latency. However, to enable those possible gains, cooperating access points must exchange some channel and traffic data, which results in new extra temporal overheads that, of course, may compromise the potential gains previously mentioned. Is it worth? Well, in a while, Lorenzo will give you some details that include performance results of one specific case enabled 
by this multi-axis point framework, coordinated beam forming and spatial reuse. However, beyond this case, still a lot of research is required to fully develop this multi-axis point framework and to understand which are the achievable performance gains. In the following, we will overview two low-complexity multi-axis point coordination solutions, coordinated spatial reuse and coordinated OFDMA. After that, GEO will take the token again to talk about two advanced and more complex solutions, joint beam forming and joint transmission. In order to enable this over-the-air multi-access point coordination, two new roles for access points are defined. The master or sharing access point, which is the access point that initiates the coordinated multi-access point transmission, and the slave or shared access point which are the access points following that request. From this point of view, there is some debate in the 11B group about how these roles must be assigned, including the case where all access points can be masters and slaves at the same time. This is, any of them can initiate a coordinated transmission when they get access to the channel. Also, new frames must be defined including a new multi-access point trigger to initiate coordinated transmissions. Similarly, new mechanisms and protocols to create and manage the access points that belong to a coordination group, for instance, how new access points can enter or leave the coordination group, must be defined. All these aspects still require some extra research by the common. To illustrate how multi-access point coordination may work, let us consider the following example, where we have two access points, access point 1 as the master and access point 2 as the slave. First, periodically, access point 2 sends to access point 1 the required information for access point 1 to decide if it is worth or not to initiate a multi-access point transmission. In the example, you can see how access point 1 as the master sends a multi-access point trigger to initiate the multi-access point transmission. Let us assume that the multi-access point trigger, for instance, indicates that the channel of 80 MHz, which is shared between the two access points, is equally divided between access point 1 and access point 2. So access point 1 takes 40 MHz and access point 2 the other 40 MHz. After this initial phase, the two access points simply start their transmissions independently, but using the agreed split of the spectrum which warranties no channel contention. In the example, access point 1 starts a downlink transmission, and access point 2 an uplink OFDMA1. The previous example is nothing else than a case of coordinated OFDMA. As you can see, it is a relatively simple technique for multi-access point coordination. This coordinated resource assignment diminishes the collision probability with respect to the case when access points implement independent procedures. Coordinated OFDMA is particularly attractive to minimize the latency of short packet transmissions, since it allows efficient sharing and full occupation of the band through collaboration. Otherwise, multiple contention processes would be necessary, and it would not be possible to fully utilize all the available resources. Let me finish this slide with the following open question. Traditionally, the problem to solve when deploying a new Wi-Fi network was how to find an ideal spectrum chunk for it, even if that means using narrow channels. Employing coordinated OFDMA, this approach must be for sure revisited, since in order to benefit from the cooperation between multiple access points, the same or at least a part of the spectrum resources must be shared between all VSS. Following the same idea, another relatively simple technique for multi-access point coordination is coordinated spatial reuse. It will be an evolution of the spatial reuse mechanism introduced by 11AX. We will briefly review them, the 11AX mechanism, later, to understand the whole picture. Special reuse in general can be used when inter-VSS interference is weak, but the channel state is perceived as busy, and so any other possible transmission is put on halt. Then, 
the idea behind the special reuse is very simple. Even if there is an ongoing transmission, maybe another device can also start a new transmission without interfering the previous one. If that happens, the network performance will be higher for sure. Of course, it might not be the case, and collisions may also happen. In the figure of the left side, access point 2 tries to use the special reuse opportunity. However, its transmission fails, since the amount of interference at the destination, station 2, is higher than expected. Luckily, the transmission from access point 1 to station 1 is not affected. In 11AX, we have uncoordinated special reuse where one access point transmits with maximum power, while the other access points should decrease its power. This facilitates a more aggressive channel access. This is, it helps to increase the number of concurrent transmissions in a straightforward way. In 11B, the 11AX special reuse is extended by adding the ability to coordinate special reuse transmissions where the access points mitigate interference by cooperatively controlling the transmission power. This requires a little inter-access point feedback. It better prevents collisions compared with coordinated special reuse from 11AX and allows to adjust the transmission power of all the devices transmitting at the same time so the overall result of that transmission is maximized. For instance, we could be interested in maximizing the aggregate throughput of the network. In the figure of the right side, access point 1 and access point 2 have agreed on the power levels to be used, so both transmissions succeed. In this case, access point 1 reduces its power level, which is still high enough to deliver its packet to station 1. However, the interference on station 2 is low, and so the packet to station 2 can be also successfully delivered. In OPSSPD, the main idea is that the transmission power is a function of the received power. For instance, as you can see in the left side of the slide, starting a transmission with a power of 21 dBm means that the received power must be lower than minus 82 dBm. In case the device wants to start a transmission but the received power in the channel is higher than minus 82 dBm, no problem, it can do it but then the device needs to reduce the transmission power accordingly. The overall procedure is described in the flow diagram of the slide. Let us assume that the device observes that the signal power in the channel is higher than the CCA threshold. Then, let us assume also that it can read the preamble, and that it determines that the ongoing transmission is of a different color than it sounds. The color is nothing else than a short code to identify in a fast way if a transmission belongs to the same or another VSS. In our example, the color is different, and therefore the transmission detected belongs to a different VSS. Then the device checks its OVSS PD threshold and observes that the received power is below than it. So it waits for an IFS and starts contending for the channel. If it is lucky, it will be able to transmit without disturbing the ongoing transmission and so benefit from the special reuse opportunity. While previous mechanism is mainly used by the access point for downlink traffic, 11AX also introduces a more advanced mechanism that benefits from the use of trigger-initiated transmissions. It is called Parameterized Special Reuse, PSR. PSR allows access points to enable or disable special reuse opportunities during access point initiated uplink transmissions by using the trigger frame. Other devices, different from the target one, that also receive and decode the trigger frame, use it to identify the PSR based special reuse opportunity, as well as the transmission power constraints and the maximum transmission duration. Those devices that decide to start a transmission in the detected special reuse opportunity follow the standard procedure, this is, back off to prevent collisions, since the decision to go to the channel is fully decentralized, and there could be several devices trying to do the same to also use that special reuse opportunity.
This is basically illustrated in the example at the bottom of the slide. Observe how the access point sends a trigger frame, enabling the special reuse operation. Then, the station requested to transmit by the trigger frame starts its own transmission, as well as other stations that detect the special reuse opportunity. More details on PSR will be given by Lorenzo in a while. To conclude this section, let us consider this toy and symmetric scenario, where two access points send data continuously. This is, the buffer is always full of packets. Without using a special reuse, since CSMACA is fair, they get exactly the same throughput, as you can see in the first two columns. In the two columns of the middle, both access points are using a special reuse following 11AX specifications, in this case, OBS and SPD. As you can see, there is some gain in throughput, around 40%, compared to the legacy case. In the two richmost columns, you can see the throughput that both access points could achieve if they are able to optimally adjust their transmission power, so the throughput of both access points is maximized. In this case, the gain, compared to the legacy operation, is of the 75%, which will correspond to the case of coordinated special reuse. Although this example is mainly theoretical, it gives an idea of what kind of gains you can achieve with the 11B and its coordinated special reuse. At this point, I leave you with Gio, who will introduce joint informing and joint transmission to advanced mechanisms that may also be included in 11B. Boris has showed you that 11B plans to take uh, access point coordination and spatial reuse to the next level. Now I'm going to describe two more sophisticated approaches for AP coordination, which may be somewhat more complicated to implement and might take a longer time to standardize compared to the last ones, but which also promise higher gains. These are coordinated beamforming and joint transmission. The first approach illustrated to the left is coordinated beamforming or coordinated null steering. Multi-antenna access points typically use their capability for spatially multiplexing stations in the same time frequency resource and or to provide useful signal power gains through beamforming. We've seen this before. Alternatively though, access points can also leverage their antennas to place spatial radiation nulls to and from non-associated stations in the neighborhood. So in the figure on the left of this slide, we see how access point one is transmitting to station one through beamforming and at the same time it is suppressing interference to station two which is being served by access point two. Access point two does the same so serves station two through beamforming and suppresses interference towards and from station one which is being served by access point one. So this approach boosts spatial reuse by enabling the simultaneous data transmission of devices within the same coverage area. When compared to coordinated OFDMA, coordinated beamforming or coordinated null steering requires a further degree of cooperation among overlapping basic service sets to organize scheduling decisions and to facilitate the acquisition of channel state information from these non-associated devices. This is essential for the effective placement of radiation nulls. The approach to the right is distributed MIMO or DMIMO or also called joint transmission and it's more complicated. So DMIMO is the most intricate solution in terms of coordination complexity being currently considered by 11BE. In DMIMO, non-co-located access points perform joint data transmission or reception from multiple stations. Compared to systems with independent access points, the tight inter-access point collaboration of DMIMO can provide extended coverage thanks to the additional beamforming gains. And because neighboring access points are turned from interferers to servers, Achieving these gains requires inter-access point collaboration to jointly process both the data and the channel state information of all stations. 
This needs a high capacity, low latency backhaul, for example, fiber or millimeter wave. Importantly, the implementation of DMIMO in 11B would require the design of new distributed CSMACA mechanism to optimize channel access and to guarantee fair coexistence with independent access points deployed in the same coverage area. Another challenge is the tight synchronization required in time, frequency and phase. For this reason, it has been proposed to implement DMIMO with a master access point that oversees the cluster operation. This might compromise the performance gains, but it would greatly simplify the, the coordination requirements. The idea here would be that uh, the master access point sends a trigger frame to participating access points to pre-compensate for the phase drifts and for the frequency offset before a DMIMO transmission. Coordinated beamforming has been included as one of the features in the specification framework document. And in what follows, Lorenzo will give you more details on one of Nokia's proposals for co coordinated beamforming and null steering in 11D. He will also show how coordinated beamforming can really help achieve low latency communications. Hi everyone, so this is Lorenzo and I'm back again to give you an overview of our proposal that we presented in the 802.11b standardization meeting. This proposal falls in the areas of multi-AP coordination and in particular focus on coordinated beam forming for increasing spatial reuse and accordingly decreasing channel access delay and latency. After introducing the general idea behind our framework, I will show as well its advantages with respect to current 11AX system. If you are interested, you can find more details in our recent paper indicated here at the bottom. Okay, so let's start from understanding which are the two fundamental key capabilities that are required for efficiently implementing coordinated beamform and non steering, and that at the moment have never been properly tackled by any 802.11 standard. So the first one is the need to have an advanced and dynamic collaboration among devices belonging to different basic service set. The second one, which relies on the first one, is the possibility to have a coordinated channel state information acquisition from inter-BSS devices and accordingly a consecutive and coordinated channel access and transmission phase. So how did we solve these two problems? We decided to build upon and further extend the PSR scheme that is currently an optional features of 802.11ax. You have seen already how PSR works, so here I would like only to summarize a few important key points by looking at the figures on the right hand side. In these diagrams, we consider a scenario with two BSS. BSS1, which is comprised of AP1 and Station 1-1, whereas BSS2 includes AP2, Station 2-1 and Station 2-2. So, in baseline 11AX operation, which is the figure at the top, when Station 1-1 is transmitting its uplink data to AP1, station connected to AP2 need to defer channel access till the completion of the communication within BSS1. However, when PSR scheme is activated, figures below, station connected to AP2 can attempt to access the channel if, with LBT, they ensure that the ongoing transmission from station 1-1 is not perceived. Moreover, they have also to reduce their transmission power to avoid harmful interference to AP1, and this is according to the information that they receive within the trigger frame that was sent from AP1. Now, having said this, what you see in this slide is the protocol that we propose to enable an efficient implementation of coordinated beam forming. Consider the same scenario as in the previous slide. The diagram here shows the additional two phases that we incorporate to the existing PSR procedure to introduce coordinated beam forming capabilities. So the first phase is an inter-BSS coordination phase where APs exchange messages to create what we call an inter-BSS coordination set. 
Among other functionality, the creation of this set allows APs to acquire CSI from InterBSS devices and determine which devices are going to be served and null. Phase 2 is the proper CSI acquisition phase where APs acquire CSI both from intra and inter-BSS devices for deciding how to place beams and nulls. As a result of implementing these two phases, APs can now steer radiation nulls towards uh, inter-BSS devices and provide an enhanced, an enhanced uh, spatial reuse when compared to the power-based PSR framework of 802.11ax. In the example of the figures, you can observe how AP1 suppresses the incoming interference from station to 1, since it plays a spatial radiation null at the reception, while receiving data from both STA11 and 12. Notice that the placement of that radiation null allows SDA to 1 to utilize a larger transmission power where compared to the normal PSR framework that is, was described in the previous slide. So similarly, AP2 suppresses the interference generated by station 11 and station 12, therefore guaranteeing a successful data reception from station 21. So to highlight the benefit of our proposed scheme, we evaluated and compared the performance of three different systems. The first system we consider is a baseline system without PSR capabilities, where the spectrum is shared as per the classical CMA-CA rules. As shown in the figures at the bottom of, of this slide, which resemble the two AP scenario we are going to evaluate, this entails that devices may listen to each other and alternate their transmission. The second system we consider is a 802.11ax system with PSR capabilities, where APs may grant spatial use opportunity to inter-BSS station when triggering up in transmission. As you can observe in the figures at the bottom of the slide, this may facilitate the appearance of spatial reuse transmission, particularly from those devices that can guarantee the receiving interference threshold set by the AP granting the spatial reuse opportunity. In the figure, you can observe how the two stations located far from AP1, which is the AP that is granting the spatial reuse opportunity, are actually capable to find a spatial reuse opportunity, and how the one on the top right is actually performing a spatial reuse transmission with constrained power towards AP2. The third alternative that we consider is our proposed scheme, where the AP triggering uplink transmission may also grant spatial reuse opportunity towards inter-BSS devices that have allocated radiation nulls. So going back to our figure at the bottom, you can observe how AP1 now steers radiation nulls toward the two closest inter-BSS station, which are associated to AP2. This allowed them to find spatial reuse opportunity, which was not possible with the power-based PSR scheme of 11AX. The main advantage in this case is that the green station in the bottom left is now able to transmit towards AP2. Having described the system we are going to evaluate at a high level, let me provide now further details regarding our simulation scenario. In the following, we are going to consider a scenario with both uplink broadband traffic modeled as a file transfer protocol, FTP service, and uplink low latency traffic modeled as an augmented reality application. In more details, we consider a file size of 0.5 megabytes and an offered traffic of 100 megabit per second for the FTP3 model and a file size of 32 bytes and a constant arrival rate of 10 milliseconds for the augmented reality model. In addition, we consider that when triggering uplink, access point spatially multiplex as many stations as possible of a same class for each TX opportunity. With this in mind, our main objective with the remaining spatial degrees of freedom is to reduce the worst case latency of the station with low latency traffic. That is why 
as this point will suppress interference only from the neighboring station with the strongest average perceived interference and generating low latency traffic. Before showing the simulator results, I would like to summarize the fundamental system model parameters of our study. In particular, we consider a system with two access points and 24 stations uniformly distributed across our scenario. Out of those 24 stations, 16 generate broadband traffic and 8 generate low latency traffic. The APs are, are equipped with the 8 antennas and we limit their maximum radiation noise to 4. So, we are now to jump into the simulation results. The first set of results that I want to show you is about the delay performance achieved by the tree system. In the figure on the right, we represent the median 5%, 1% and 0.01% worst case MAC layer latency, which are experienced by the augmented low latency station. The first observation we can make is that 802.11b devices with the proposed coordinated beamforming frameworks allow for an almost 10 times reduction of the worst case latency. This is generated by the possibility to have a more aggressive and coordinated spectrum access associated with the strong inter-BSS interference mitigation which is produced by the presence of the nulls. The second important observation is that 802.11ax devices with or without PSR capabilities struggle to maintain consistent low latency in the worst cases, under the particular dense and loaded circumstances of uh, this experiment. It can be easily noted how for these two systems latency remains around 3 milliseconds in the 50% of the cases, but it rapidly goes above 200 milliseconds in the worst case scenario. And to complete the study, we also show here the effect over the throughput. In the figure on the right, you can see the cumulative density function of the uplink file throughput achieved by station requesting broadband traffic. The good news is that 11B devices equipped with our proposed coordinated beamforming scheme are capable to decrease the worst case latency, as shown in the previous slide, and at the same time, as indicated here in this figure, the yellow curve, they are also able to roughly preserve the throughput of the device requesting broadband traffic. The small difference in throughput with respect to 11AX system is mostly caused by a reduction in the receiving beamforming gain, which is associated with the need to allocate some of degrees of freedom of the antenna array to the placement of the radiation nulls. And finally, we can observe how 11AX system with the PSR which is the red curve, basically preserve the throughput and they actually introduce a small improvement in some cases, which is associated to the fact that spatial reuse opportunities are available not only to station demanding low latency traffic, but also to the one demanding broadband traffic. Very well. So we have finished here the overview of the 11B standard and uh, its associated features. I hope you have enjoyed and also that you found this tutorial useful. Now, before leaving Boris concluding the tutorial with an overview of the potential open problems and research direction, I'll try here to briefly summarize what we have learned today. The main takeaway of this tutorial is that the key objective of 11BE is to announce the peak throughput up to 30 gigabit per second per access point. However, providing low latency and high reliability to enable new real application and use case is also an important target. And you have seen that dedicated set of features are under discussion to improve this important KPI. Regarding the standardization timeline, the goal is to have release one features ready in the first draft of the standard round mid-2022, and instead the remaining features will be included in release 2 and available in subsequent draft. 
This table instead summarizes the main features improvement of 11B with respect to state-of-art 11AX. In a nutshell, 11B will give the possibility to transmit and receive over wider bands, will natively operate in 2.4, 5 and 6 GHz. Moreover, it will increase the number of spatial streams till 16, and associated to this, it will also introduce an implicit CSI acquisition scheme to reduce the channel sounding overhead. Finally, most importantly, it will introduce new disruptive features like multi-link, multi-IP coordination scheme, and finally, even a more efficient retransmission capabilities. Boris here. Glad to share with you some thoughts about several open problems and research directions in Wi-Fi. Most of the 11B features we have introduced before still require a lot of work to be completed, as we have already provided some hints about. However, the following slides don't go in that direction. I'm just going to point out three big aspects that, in our opinion, require much attention from the research community in the forthcoming years. The goal, indeed, is not to provide answers, on the contrary, to open some questions. In previous slides, Gio, Lorenzo and myself have introduced many new 11AX and 11B features, such as OFDMA, Special Reuse, Multilingual Operation, and Multi-Access Point Cooperation, among others. The fact is that all these features are great, although it's not easy to say when, where, and how they must be used. We are still far to understand how to extract the maximum performance of many of them, especially when combined. For example, what is the best way to combine multilink and coordinated special reuse? Or maybe they must be just applied in different cases and never combined. So our first open challenge is to find how to extract the maximum performance of each individual feature and then understand how they can be optimally combined. We are sure many Wi-Fi manufacturers and operators are currently wondering what to do with that myriad of new options. Also, you have to keep in mind that 11AX and 11B amendments will provide the technologies but don't say how to use them. And so, there is a huge room for research. I hope we agree on previous challenge. However, then the question is how we can do research on that. Another huge challenge is to develop tools able to evaluate those new features in different scenarios and situations, given reliable and reproducible results. While the use of analytical tools is always a plus, and they may provide some useful insights, the complexity of current Wi-Fi networks make necessary to use the tailored simulators, or even better, the use of testbeds, where real devices can be used. Let me mention the case of the Network Simulator 3, NS3. It is a grid tool that includes the full TCP IP stack, Wi-Fi modules, and it is validated by the community. So it seems a perfect option to be used. However, new 11AX and 11B features are not yet there. And so, to do research on them requires first a huge development effort, which means a lot of time and resources, and that must be taken into account too. In any case, in my opinion, the best approach is to combine all types of tools, as they excel in different aspects, analysis to provide general insight, simulations to test multiple scenarios, configurations and algorithms, and testbeds for validation. Alternatively, instead of trying to think what is the best solution, which indeed may be unfeasible, since there are many different scenarios, features, mechanisms, requirements, configurations, and so on, we can rely on machine learning to learn from collected data, this is, key performance indicators from the network. What to learn? Well, what are the best 11AX and 11B features to use in each case, as well as with which parameters they should be configured. This sounds pretty good, and this may seem easy also, 
but then the challenge is how to choose the appropriate machine learning model, how to train it, and how to integrate it in the resource management control loop. A solution to all these questions is the work referenced below, where a general and flexible machine learning based network architecture proposed by the International Telecommunications Union is applying to Wi Fi networks. In case you are interested in the topic, I believe it's a good first reference. And here it comes my last slide. The goal of this slide is not to give you our vision regarding what will be Wi Fi 8, understanding Wi Fi 8 as the evolution of Wi Fi 7, and built on top of a new physical and Mac amendment that will replace 11B in the future. Indeed, we simply aim to finish this tutorial raising some questions that we expect will make you think about what will come next. The first point is that even if 11b is still in its early development phase, all new features are already there. Therefore, it's already time to start thinking on what will come next. A first question we should ask ourselves is what will the requirements of Wi-Fi 8 be? We think a reasonable target will be a peak throughput of 100 gigabits per second and a latency lower than 0.1 millisecond, as well as to operate again in the 2.4, 5 and 6 GHz bands. To achieve those requirements, we may see Wi-Fi 8 as an umbrella to integrate network interfaces operating in the millimeter wave and in the terahertz bands. All of them under a common control and management framework, such as the multilink operation. A second question is if Wi Fi 8 will be just an evolution of Wi Fi 6 and 7, by just increasing channel width using high, higher order constellations, or by adding more antennas at the access points, so techniques such as massive MIMO can be further developed. Maybe Wi-Fi 8 can also add some new disruptive features, not yet considered such as in-channel full duplex by using interference cancellation or non-orthogonal multiple access. In any case, for sure, it will further consolidate technologies currently under discussion, but that may not be included in Wi-Fi 7, such as distributed MIMO, or consolidate operation modes such as low latency by finally supporting sometimes sensitive networking features. Beyond them, and to conclude, we are sure Wi Fi 8 will include artificial intelligence and machine learning functionalities in its code, not just to find better configurations as mentioned in the previous slide, if not maybe also for the design on the fly of new protocols and features able to suit any new scenario and situation. If you are interested to know more, in the following you can find a selected and updated collection of references that has been used to produce the material presented in this tutorial. Mainly you can find standard contribution, but also, for example, books, papers, video tutorial, more standard contribution, and also our communication magazine papers, which can give you a good summary of what we presented today. With this, we are really done. Thanks a lot for your attention on behalf of Giovanni, Boris and myself. Hopefully we managed to guide you through with clarity over the Wi-Fi of the future. So I guess here now we can open the live Q&A. Thanks a lot.